Ladies and gentlemen, we will now resume our 21st Optimist International Convention at Kuala Lumpur. It is my greatest pleasure to call upon Datuk Anusha Santhirasit Stipam, President of the Host Federation, Soroptimist International of the Southwest Pacific, to give her welcome remarks. My beloved sisters, and brothers serving us so faithfully, so wonderfully, including bringing me up with the hydraulics. Right. What would we do without the men eh? and their mechanical abilities? <laughs> and the cameraman whom I have to make love to through the lenses because he's a man there. And because we are being filmed, and if we do this right, ladies, we won't be just sitting in the Kuala Lumpur Convention Center. I would like all our speeches, all our heartfelt presentations to be on YouTube, to be on Facebook, to be on InstaShare, and to be on every possible media because... Women have a global voice. Yes. Yes, we have, right? Let's raise the energy. And for that, I have to bring out and show you my Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator boots. So, this is, this is what a warrior queen looks like when she goes to battle. And uh, can stand for a few seconds. If, and if I start to do this, then you know I'm not dancing. It's time to go and get seated. So my darling ladies from all over the planet, this is all about you. This whole convention is about you. You are our reason for existence. You are our heart. You generate the greatest ideas, creativity and innovation in your glorious minds. You are the soul of feminine power, which is, by the way, here, if you know where your feminine chakra is, just one inch below your navel, just touch your navel and go one inch below. And ladies... This is the seat of feminine power. And if you want to know how to breathe deeply and bring in all that feminine energy, do it now. Because you are the womb of creation. You are the womb of innovation. All my scientists down there, all those people from the United Nations and from World Bank and from all the organizations. Tell me, how many of you here in this room have created at least one human being by a show of hands? How many of you have helped to create magic in the life of your life partner. Thought so. How many of you have transformed the lives of women and girls? How many of you have been rejuvenated the day you signed up and became a Soroptimist. Absolutely. So this is why we are here. Because we know we live, we learn, we share, we grow, we evolve. We are great when we are together. Right? 
Oh, no, that doesn't sound right. Malaysia has fed you. We have fed you so much food. You have got to show that love. You got to show that energy. Are you great? Are you feeling great? Are you ready to become even greater? Yes. And is Kuala Lumpur the greatest place you've been so far in your lives? Yes. All right. Now they have to make me Minister of Tourism for Malaysia and the next cabinet reshuffle. But before that, can I just say how delighted I am as the host federation president of Sir Optimus International of the Southwest Pacific to welcome you from the bottom of my heart. You make our lives worth living when you come from thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away, crossing so many time zones to be with us today. I want you now to turn to your partner on your right and say, Welcome to Kuala Lumpur, your partner on your right. Now to your partner on your left, say, Welcome to Kuala Lumpur. And then, you're going to tell me a few words because I want to get the audience to do the work, not me stand here and make speeches. Do you wish to be inspired? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Do you wish to be Influenced so you can influence others. Do you wish to be informed so you have the wisdom to make the right decisions? Do you wish to share your experiences? Oh, nobody wants to share experiences, workshops. Question time. We have world famous speakers here. Don't you want to just grill them for information? You came thousands of miles away, right? This is your chance. Seize the day. So ladies, this is your days. These are your days. These are the best days of your life. When we are together as one. Once every four years, we come together as one. We are not four federations separately doing things. We are one world. One world. One vision. One voice. Right? One world. One vision. One voice. And with that, ladies, I don't know how many... Oh, I have two and a half minutes. I can do a lot in two and a half minutes, you know. You are here to fulfill your burning desire to connect. Your global connections. Our global connections indeed. Whether it's at the United Nations as an ECOSOC organization since 1946. Don't play, play. We have been... With the United Nations since 1946. 1946. That's a long time of connection. Global connections. And there's so much more we could do as a one united world team. We are here to make sure that everyone has access to water and sanitation and food. We are here for equal opportunities, gender equality, and equal power in decision-making. Right? Because why are we still the best-kept secret? Why, why has Sir Optimus got to be the best-kept secret? Why is it he's got to be... You know, my husband says, you know what? You people are the secret Illuminati. And then... He makes jokes. He introduces me to his golfing friends. And he says, oh, my wife, Anusha, she's part of a secret society. 
they are so secret and he says i don't know about these women but they are sorrowfully optimistic <laughs> men and he used to be a rotarian so he doesn't grumble when i go for meetings he doesn't grumble when i fly anywhere just like jp mar international president's husband where are you jp busy selling for the water projects what a wonderful husband so this is it the sroptimisters can we give a shout out for the sroptimisters the partners who allow us the freedom to be the women we really are give it up give it up for our children and our grandchildren who allow us who embrace us who celebrate us for the mothers and grandmothers who are activists give it up for our children and grandchildren come on they are our future sroptimists and sroptimisters if you haven't converted your child or grandchild 9 seconds left please get on your phones at lunch time and do a bit of conversion and with that ladies namaste i love you and it is my greatest humblest honor to be with you and to serve you not just as the president of the federation from mongolia in the north of asia to samoa in the deep south pacific and to embrace all my sisters in the americas oh 48 seconds oh the clock is magic here 48 seconds to embrace my sisters okay to embrace my sisters across the pacific ocean of the americas where are you shout out si americas oh my god it's so far away in canada i can't hear you in latin america where are you darlings of si americas that's more like it babies all right my sisters across the indian ocean as i great britain and ireland where are you our sisters of europe when you cross the bosphorus in istanbul asia joins europe say hello to the europeans and our new new darling sisters in africa ring out loud africa and with great dignity honor and love stand up southwest pacific and show up all the southwest pacific sisters there are your hosts they are your friends they are your sisters and they love you they welcome you and we will make sure you have a party when we are not in here being enlightened thank you thank you president anusha for your encouragement and for being such a hero <laughs> and now it gives me great honor and privilege to invite our sroptimist international immediate past president Yvonne Simpson to give her opening address <laughs> Yvonne thank you okay uh, president marit distinguished guests sroptimist sisters and sroptimist brothers uh, my friends tenakoto tenakoto in a cultural couture no my hide my greetings to you all and welcome 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 to this convention welcome to this particular venue and this i think is a venue that we can see is fit for a queen do you not agree yeah i think i think it is a place that we can be assured of uh, having an inspirational time regally elegantly and i look forward to the convention so when i was thinking of this venue i also thought of other buildings in my life 
And as you know, I am from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and in 2012, my hometown of Christchurch met with a challenge. So I thought of some buildings from that time, and I thought of this building, and this building has a plan. A plan, it has a design, it was compliant with the building code, but when it got to the one very strong challenge, it failed, and it failed very badly. This other, um, keep on looking down there. This other building, however, this was where we were going to hold the conference in the Grand Chancellor Hotel. And in that hotel, that hotel also had a plan. It was compliant with the building code, but it stood tall. It saw itself through the disaster and kept everybody safe. And I thought to myself, that reminds me. I sort of realised at that time that maybe a building and an organisation has something in common. We need a plan, we need a, a code, a constitution, and we need a structure. So for Sir Optimus International in 2015, the first challenge was to create a plan. We had lots of conversations around what is the purpose of Sir Optimist International? Why do we have it? And so we thought about that, made a plan, and in that plan we looked at the structure. Those of you who know about teamwork, you know that you build a team and you go through stages. Your first meeting is very polite. That's the conform stage. You form, you conform. And then you storm, and storm is the creative stage where people say, well, actually, I don't like that one, or I disagree with that one, or what about this one? And so that's that very creative storm stage. And when you develop trust and respect through your team members, you then move on to the perform stage. And so each time you have a new member for your team, you actually create a new group. And so our restructuring that happened at the end of 2000, the biennium of 2017, which was the passed on to Marie to implement, uh, was based on, we, we looked at, I looked at anyway, the, 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 the stages that you go through and how we can make this better. Um, I would like to do a shout out to the restructuring committee of uh, Carolyn Hudson, Sam Bucano, Elisabetta de Franciscus, Anne Hodgson, and ex officio of Marita myself, for bringing forward to the board three options, and the board chose this one. And why they chose it, maybe, was because we needed to empower the directors, we needed to reduce the numbers so that we were fiscally responsible, we needed to enable that the president, the treasurer, and the IDA had a vote. So we looked at it fiscally, we looked at it empowerment, and we looked at sustainability. Now, one of the issues and the challenges that in the biennium 2015 to 17 and every biennium before, there was at least a 50% turnover of directors at at least four different times in the year. So that made building a team quite challenging. So, as I said, we brought in a restructure, and I think that was the major achievement governance-wise for Sir Optimus International. So we needed a plan. We talked about what is the purpose of SI and we went back to the point of agreement. We looked at things that needed to be looked at and we went through from our vision, our mission, our values, our principles and decided, yes, they were on, on scheme for us to uh, keep going. And then we confirmed the five priority areas. Now, this is not a conversation that actually came through from the previous biennium as well under President Anne Garvey. And so it's a flow on. It doesn't just happen, you know, in one, one short term. So we needed to clarify what SI did. And therefore, we needed to clarify what SI did not do. And Sir Optus International does not do membership. Sir Optus International does not do programme. But of course, we need... Those, those aspects and the Federation's responsibility to look after those and bring them together. So the five priorities, uh, advocacy was the main one and we uh, empowered the advocacy team, made it stronger. We had an international director of advocacy rather than a program director. We strengthened the United Nations teams. We made appointments of specialists to the advocacy uh, committee. And 
you know, it, it became a stronger and stronger uh, group of, of women. And International Director Bev Buker will actually share more about that at the end of convention in her section. Another priority is the President's Appeal. And thanks to uh, Sharon Fisher and the President's Appeal team, we had a very successful President's Appeal for Nepal. Educate to Lead Nepal was very successful, I'm very grateful, and we're still ongoing. More about that at the end of convention as well. Our communications priority was, to me, the highlight was the launch of the new website. And a shout out there to Global Executive Director uh, Deborah Thomas and Communications Manager Sarah, who are both here uh, at this convention. So if you appreciate being part of a Global Voice through our uh, website and through Global Voice, please share with them the thrill of being part of that. The SI Convention is also another priority for us, so please join me in applauding Puan Sing Tzu Yong and her team for putting together such an incredible <laughs> opportunity. We're here to inspire and be inspired for a sustainable world with global connections, and it's up to us to grab that with both hands. The fifth priority is that of strategic leadership, and I was thrilled that the SI Board uh, took up the plan of a leadership development committee, and that was ably led in our biennium by Ulla Madsen. And so we brought in training for, uh, for directors on their responsibilities because we are a company now and we need the directors to know their rights and their responsibilities. Fiscally, uh, effective, transparency, all of it. Also, we, uh, time flies, and in 2021, we will have a centennial celebration, and there will be a virtual museum, and I look forward to the launch of that. Now, I'll make it more personal, because that's my style. I learned a few things which empowered me in my leadership role, and one of them was to know what authority I had to act. So those of you who take up a leadership post, read your constitution and have that by your bedside. I was advised that many years ago. I also learnt that there are many different styles of leadership, so the idea is to be authentic to your own style, but to recognise that other styles have a contribution. And when you're dealing with feisty women, they all have leadership styles that uh, sometimes need to be catered for. I wanted to also um, say that a major lesson is succession planning. There is no success without succe uh, a successor. And so as soon as Marit came on board as president-elect, we got her busy. Can you imagine Marit not busy? But the last thing I'd like to share with you is that I was very privileged, very privileged. And of course, it's natural for, I thought, for an Aotearoa New Zealand seroptimist to be a leader of Seroptimist International. And I can show you why. Because New Zealand is there at the top of the world, centre stage, as you can see. It's, New Zealand is the first country to see the world, New Day. New Zealand was the first country in the world to give the vote to women, including indigenous women, in 1893. So I was, I was automatically advantaged in being taking up this post. Now, and, um, Marit followed me, and she lives, she's from somewhere down, somewhere down, somewhere. So whether you're at the top of the world or squashed up at the bottom, you can step up to a role, and you too can actually play your part. Because playing your part is really crucial. I invite you to play your part, because if I go back to those buildings, those first two slides, Without you, when we face a crisis, we could crumble. We need to develop our membership. We need to strengthen that. With you, like the Hotel Grand Chancellor, we can stand tall. We can hold our own and we can live in a world where there are many changes and many challenges. So please enjoy the, co the convention. Be inspired. Be challenged. And to return home re-energised to fulfil our mission to transform the lives and status of women and girls. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, Yvonne.
for sharing with us SI's way forward and its priorities. And now it's my pleasure to again invite Dr. Anusha, who is facilitating this special session, to introduce our special guest keynote speaker, Christina Lam, OBE. Before I hand over the stage to Dato Anusha, let me just brief you on how we will gather questions from the delegates. Questions for Christina Lam can be submitted via the MICE apps. However, if you're not familiar with the app, you can request a question card from an usher and write down your question and hand it over to them. With that, Datu Anusha. Dearly beloveds in the audience, we are very honored, we are very humbled, and we are absolutely thrilled to have you with us, our honored special keynote speaker, Christina Lam, all the way from the United Kingdom. Show her your love. Christina Lam needs no introduction, and obviously her profile is available in the book, but can I just say from the bottom of my heart, the impressions I have of you when I followed you and your missions from the comfort of my home, knowing that you have been in places that we can only dream and even have nightmares about. Christina, we are in awe of you. And I leave you to unfold your story as you know best. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I was wondering how I was going to follow Anusha's speech earlier. <laughs> so it's an um, absolute pleasure to be here amongst so many amazing women from so many places and to be in Malaysia for the first time in my life. I actually grew up hearing about Malaysia because my dad did his national service in Penang. And it was the first time that he had ever been abroad. And his absolute most treasured possession was a, a faded blue photograph album of um, black and white pictures of him as a curly-haired young man on a palm-fringed beach, and he always said it was the best time of his life, which I could see that my mum didn't like very much. <laughs> but I think perhaps somewhere deep inside of me gave me the sort of travel bug that there was an exciting world out there, far from the suburbs of London. So it's wonderful to get the opportunity to come here, and it's also great to be among so amazing women. <laughs> Our first female Prime Minister in the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher, famously said, if you want something said, ask a man. If you want something done, ask a woman. <laughs> so these days, you might have heard that in my country, we have a little problem called Brexit. <laughs> um, we won't talk about that. <laughs> but there are also big changes for women that are happening it's no longer okay to have all-male panels in conferences or all-male panels on television shows. And we just had record viewing figures for the Women's Football World Cup. So it seems to be a very exciting moment when more and more people are realizing the value of harnessing the power of women. Something we all know, I think. But there are, of course, many parts of the world which have much further to go. I was recently in eastern Congo, which is one of the most difficult and forgotten places on earth, and it's often referred to as the rape capital of the world. I went to a hospital in a place called Bukavu, which was run by an amazing man called Dennis McQuiggy, who you might have heard about because he won the Nobel Peace Prize last year. 
And he has literally treated more than 54,000 rape victims. I came across in his hospital something shocking beyond words. The week that I was there, he had a seven-month-old baby and a four-year-old girl who'd both been raped. This is just unimaginable, I think, on so many levels. But while I was there, I also met a woman, a young woman called Jane, who had been raped 13 times and had had so many operations to try and repair her, but she was still incontinent. And yet, she smiled and she danced, for she was one of a number of survivors at an absolutely remarkable place called City of Joy. This is Jane in the green on the edge. And it's a place which encourages survivors to own their own story and realize that it's not them who should be ashamed, but their perpetrators. And aside from counseling, it teaches them to be self-sufficient, as all too often they're cast out by their families and communities, and also to look after themselves with yoga and meditation. So I've been a war correspondent, which is what I do, for 32 years. And in that time, I've seen many terrible things and come across many such inspirational people as Jane in dark places. And it's that which really keeps me going. So today, I want to talk a bit about some of these women and what we can learn from them. But first of all, I'll just talk a little bit about what I do. Perhaps like many of you here, I work in a field which is still very male. And my job is to go where wars are. I go to places where most normal people are leaving. In my fridge, between bottles of Sauvignon Blanc and tomato ketchup, is a cholera vaccine. And in my wardrobe, where most women keep a little black dress, I keep my flak jacket like that. So I think often when people think of war correspondents, they think of William Boot in Evelyn Waugh's famous book, Scoop. But the advent of female war correspondents is not the only way that the job has changed from those days. I certainly don't travel as William Boot did, with humidors and hampers and astrolabes and zinc-lined trunks to keep ants at bay. No, these days it's cereal bars and my flak jacket with the word press on the front, which British soldiers think is very funny to come and press. <laughs> I have to say that loses its charm after all. <laughs> but some of you may be under the mistaken impression that being a foreign correspondent is glamorous. So I'd like to take you back to November 2017, when Zimbabwe's longtime dictator, Robert Mugabe, who I believe was actually a re regular visitor to this town, um, had been arrested, and tanks surrounded parliament and the state broadcaster, and a general had appeared on TV saying, this is not a military coup. A coup, a good old-fashioned coup. You don't get many of those anymore. So the call went round Fleet Street to me and all my colleagues dispatching us to Heathrow. There are no direct flights from London to Zimbabwe. So all of us, the Guardian, the Independent, um, myself, the BBC, Channel 4, we were all on a, a plane to Johannesburg. And journalists are not welcome, really, in Zimbabwe, particularly British journalists. So when we got to Johannesburg Airport, we all got the news from our foreign desk that the Times correspondent, who was ahead of us, had actually been stopped at the airport and sent back. So everybody was worried, how are they going to get in? So they said to me, you've gone to Zimbabwe a lot, how do you get in? So I showed them my Lonely Planet guide, my fake travel itinerary, which said that I was going to Lake Kariba, and most importantly, my funny straw hat. So they looked, and then uh, we were all separated for coffee. And when I got to the plane to go on to Harare, I looked around in horror, because the only people on the flight were other British journalists, and every single one of them was wearing a funny straw hat. <laughs> Myself, the male, and the independent. 
So how did sneaking into dictatorships in silly headgear become part of my life? I actually never set out to become a war correspondent. It was all the result of an unexpected wedding invitation. I'd left university telling my poor mother, life is about the journey, not the destination. In other words, I didn't have a job. Um, and I had this dream of being a novelist and going and living in a garret. But the problem was I didn't have any money. So um, I worked for a while that summer as an intern at the Financial Times in London. Um, one day the foreign editor was supposed to be going to a lunch of South Asian politicians. And last minute he couldn't go. So he said to me, you're always going on about India. Why don't you go to this lunch? So I went. And I sat next to somebody who was the Secretary General of the Pakistan People's Party, which was Benazir Bhutto's party. And she was living at that time in London in exile. So this man asked me, would you like to interview Benazir? Of course I said yes. The day I went to interview her was the day that she announced her engagement to Asif Ali Zadari. So her flat was absolutely full of bouquets of flowers. And we got on very well. She was very good at charming foreign journalists, particularly male journalists, I think. Anyway, she then went back to Pakistan, and I went to work in a place called Birmingham in England. And one day I came home from work, and on my doormat was the most beautiful gold-inscribed wedding invitation, and it was to Benazir's wedding in Pakistan. Well... Any of you who are familiar with South Asian weddings will know that they're very colourful <laughs> and go on for a very long time. Um, and her wedding, for me, was like something out of Arabian Nights. It was my first introduction to Pakistan. It was incredibly um, colourful. But also, every night after the ceremonial events, there would be discussions between Benazir and her colleagues from her political party on how to try and topple Pakistan's military dictatorship. So I was meeting people who had been tortured, tear gassed, arrested, all trying to bring democracy to their country, something I'd always taken for granted. I was fascinated. The most dangerous thing I'd ever done was try to find my way home late at night from central London when I missed the train. So I came back home and gave him my notice. Um, the last story I ever did for British TV in Birmingham was a man who turned his car back to front so it looked like he was going forwards when he was going backwards. I don't think I was a great loss to television. <laughs> so I talked to foreign editors about reporting from Pakistan, but none of them were interested. They all said, oh, um, General Z has been there for 11 and a half years, nothing's going to change. And I said, but Benazir is going to topple him. <laughs> and they looked at me as though I was very naive. But they said to me, we are interested in Afghanistan. Because at that time, this was the late 1980s, the Russians were in Afghanistan, which they'd occupied. So I said, all right, I'll cover that. So I took something, I flew to Ralpindi, and I took something called a flying coach up the Grand Trunk Road to Peshawar, which on the edge of the... Kyber Pass, and started work as a foreign correspondent. I had absolutely no idea what foreign correspondents did or needed. Um, I took a huge suitcase full of all sorts of useless things, including a giant bottle of Chanel No. 5 and a, a big bag of wine gums and lots of books by Kipling. Um, and actually, Peshawar had not changed very much since Kipling's time. It was still full of these old wooden buildings which seemed to lean on each other and lots of men who seemed to be wearing eyeliner and carrying rifles on their backs. So it was a fascinating place. I didn't know anyone there, no idea where I was going to stay, so I asked a rickshaw driver to take me to a cheap hotel and he took me to somewhere called Green's Hotel, which turned out to be where arms dealers stayed. <laughs> I discovered this because somebody tried to sell me a Chinese multi-barrel rocket launcher over breakfast. <laughs> it was very cheap, apparently. So, because I didn't know what foreign correspondents really did, I looked around what to do, and Pakistan's military intelligence was in charge of distributing the arms and money to the different groups fighting the, the Soviets. 
and they created seven different groups following the old sort of British divide and rule policy. So I went to interview all of those seven groups. Um, because of that, I went to the smallest group, and its spokesperson was a gawky Afghan in a leather jacket who loved Cadbury's chocolate and Somerset Maugham stories and Tennyson poetry. And his name was Hamid Karzai, and we became close friends. And he told me, if you want to understand Afghanistan, you need to understand the tribes of southern Afghanistan. And he introduced me to lots of tribesmen who all had the most astonishing stories, most of which seemed to be about killing people. But it made me think, I can't make up stories like this. I want to write their stories rather than write novels. So I started traveling in and out of Afghanistan with the Mujahideen. At that time, I was just 22, and you can imagine it was very exciting. It, the war seemed to be very romantic cause that it was these um, men from the mountains with old Lee Enfield rifles and rope sandals fighting one of the most powerful armies on earth. It was also my first introduction to war correspondence. So they all used to congregate in a place in Peshawar called the American Club, which is where you could get cheeseburgers and Budweiser's. And I will never forget entering for the first time and seeing these grizzled Americans sitting on the seats at the bar, drinking Jack Daniels and smoking. I probably remember this wrong now, but it seems to me they'd all got kind of bullet holes and bloodstains on their jackets. And so they turned and kind of looked me up and down. And one of them said to me, how many wars have you covered? So I was like, uh, it's my first. And then they swiveled back again. So at that time, many of those Americans had actually reported in Vietnam. And they saw what was happening in Afghanistan as a chance for revenge against the Russians. This was still in the Cold War. And the priority of the West was to defeat the Soviet Union. And to do this, the CIA had encouraged the use of jihadi fighters, many of whom were former convicts from Arab states, who were only too happy to get rid of their troublemakers. So the American club was in university town in Peshawar, and it was just along the road from a guest house, which was run by a certain Osama bin Laden. Of course, then we were all on the same side. Never did we imagine that they would become fanatical terrorists who would fly planes into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And going back through my notebooks to write a book on Afghanistan called Farewell Kabul, it was really chilling to see how such short-term decisions have had terrifying long-term consequences. One of the people that I interviewed back at the time when the, the um, Russians had been forced out of Afghanistan in '89 was the then head of Pakistan's military intelligence, General Hamid Ghul. And I had a quote from him in my notebook which said, you in the West think you can use these fundamentalists as cannon fodder, then abandon them, but it will come back to haunt you. Well, the West abandoned Afghanistan almost overnight. Sorry, this is a very unattractive photograph of me in Afghanistan. When the Russians had been forced out, and eventually I left too, I never imagined that I would be back 12 years later following my own country fighting in Afghanistan. Britain had, after all, fought three wars in Afghanistan, not very successfully. And one of our prime ministers, Harold Macmillan, famously said, first rule of politics, never invade Afghanistan. They might add these days, never have a referendum. But <laughs> um, in... <laughs> In 2006, I was uh, with British troops in Helmand when we were ambushed by the Taliban and narrowly escaped with our lives, which really brought home just how dangerous it was. So the following year, 2007, Benazir Bhutto returned to Pakistan again after another nine years in exile, and she asked me to go with her. But when I interviewed her in London, just before she went back, she told me that she'd had lots of assassination threats. After this recent narrow escape in the ambush, I wasn't sure I wanted to take another risk like that. So my plan was to go on the media bus behind her, 
But then we landed in Karachi, and I saw all the crowds and excitement, her on top of the bus, and I knew I had to be there. It was fine to start with. There were huge crowds everywhere, people on top of roofs, trees, clinging on lampposts, on top of buildings. The atmosphere was electric. Benazir was overjoyed to be back. There were music, people releasing doves, children. Not releasing children, I mean. <laughs> um, and it was just an amazing atmosphere. But I could also see that we were on top of an open-top bus, and we were very exposed, particularly as the route to the Jinnah Mausoleum, where she was due to speak, took us under 15 bridges and flyovers. So I asked the head of security, how are you going to protect Benazir? And he said, it's in God's hands, which I didn't find very reassuring. With so many people in the street, our progress was so slow that it actually got dark. And Benazir pointed out to me that the street lights kept going off. Also, the jammers, which were supposed to block any signals that could set off a suicide bomb, were clearly not working because our mobile phones were working. However, there was so much excitement, and the journey went on so long, nine hours we were on the bus, we even ordered in pizzas, and we were joking about needing breakfast too. So I forgot about the danger. So it was a complete shock when suddenly, just before midnight, there was a low boom, like a steel door scraping across concrete. The bus lurched and the music stopped. I'd been in suicide bombings before, and I knew that there's often a second bigger blast, so I shouted at everyone to stay down. But within a minute, there was a much bigger second explosion, much louder, and orange flames everywhere. Then there was silence, and then sirens. I was terrified that the fuel tank would catch fire, so we all jumped off the top of the bus and then ran like crazy, Everywhere we ran, we could see blood and sandals and body parts. 150 people were killed that night. It was Pakistan's biggest bomb. Afterwards, when I was washing off flecks, literally of other people's burnt flesh and blood in my shower that night, I thought, that's it. I'd already had way more than my nine lives, and I thought it was time to quit. But my first evening back in London, I went to a dinner, which was to honour a remarkable woman called Beatrice Matetwa, who is a brave human rights lawyer from Zimbabwe. And I told her I couldn't see the point in going undercover and putting people at risk to talk to me when it didn't make any difference. The regime just continued. She told me, if people like you don't report, what's the point of people like me doing what I'm doing? It reminded me a story I used to read my son, who was then little, from Dr. Zeus, about the Lorax. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. It's not. But more and more, I wonder, is bearing witness enough? The great Martha Gullhorn wrote, When I was young, I thought of journalism as a guiding light. I think I imagined public opinion as a solid force, something like a tornado, always ready to blow on the side of angels. But what if they don't? Over the last four years, I've come across stories of such brutality towards women that I have found them hard to write. Most of us women, I think, know that feeling of walking in a dark lane and hearing steps suddenly quickening behind us, or a senior colleague pushing up against us at a work party inappropriately. So now imagine what it must have been like to be in the Galaxy Cinema in Mosul, where hundreds of Yazidi girls were being kept after being abducted by ISIS. Sorted into the ugly and the beautiful, what terror they must have felt as ISIS fighters came through, touched their breasts and hair, and chose which one to buy. 5,000 Yazidi women were abducted by ISIS and sold into sex slavery for as little as the price of a cigarette packet. I met some of the survivors deep in a house in the German forest, and all the light seemed to have gone from their eyes. One of them, a 16-year-old, told me the worst moment of her time as a sex slave was when her captor, a fat judge, brought back a 10-year-old and raped her all night in the adjoining room as she cried for her mother. 
In northern Nigeria, in April 2014, in the small town of Chibok, more than 200 schoolgirls were abducted by the terrorist group Boko Haram from their dormitory, making headlines across the world for a couple of weeks. But when I traveled north, I found thousands more had been abducted, completely unreported. Some had since been freed in military operations and were in camps and told me of how they'd been raped, forced to marry Boko Haram fighters. And then, when they were freed by the Nigerian army, they were raped again. Then they were put in IDP camps where their own families and communities wouldn't take them back fearing that they'd been indoctrinated or seeing them as sullied. The only way they could get food was to sleep with camp officials, so they were victims over and over. Of course, rape in war is nothing new, from the ancient Greeks, Persians and Romans to the comfort women of the Imperial Japanese Army and the rapes of German women by the Red Army in World War II. Women have long been seen as spoils of war, But in recent years, it seems as though ethnic and sectarian groups have used rape almost as a weapon of mass destruction, not just to humiliate and terrorize communities, but to wipe out what they see as rival ethnicities or non-believers. And it remains extremely hard to get justice. Not one member of ISIS or Boko Haram has been indicted for sexual violence. And rape is not something that just happens in war. It's been enshrined in international law as a crime against humanity for a century. I'm so angry about it that I'm currently doing a book on uh, sexual violence in conflict and the fight for justice. And I'll actually be going from here to the Philippines to talk to some of the last surviving comfort women who after 70 years is still waiting for apologies and for justice. People often ask me, why do you do it? And of course, it's partly to highlight such injustice. And it's frustrating when things don't change. But as I said at the beginning, what keeps me going are the inspirational people I meet, most of whom seem to be women. A few years ago, I was lucky enough to work with Malala, who risked her life to go to school. And yet, despite being shot, she shows no bitterness. She even says she would like to meet the gunman who shot her, and explain why it's important for girls to go to school, if only so that their own sisters and mothers can be treated by female nurses and female doctors. Then there was this girl, Najin, an amazing Syrian refugee with cerebral palsy, who crossed all the way from war-torn Aleppo to Cologne in Germany in a rickety wheelchair pushed by her sister, I was covering the refugee crisis in 2015, and I think it was a time when we saw both the the worst and best of humanity, the best being local people, mostly women, like the widows in Lesbos who came out on the beaches and gave hot drinks and dry clothes to the refugees. The worst were the governments, some of whom, such as Hungary, literally built fences to stop the refugees coming in. So I was in Hungary the day that they finished the fence and closed off the border to refugees with a group of other journalists. And somebody said, hey, have you heard on the other side, the Serbian side, there is a girl in a wheelchair who speaks fluent English and wants to be an astronaut. So that's like journalistic gold. (laughs) So everybody wants to go meet her. And I finally did. And sure enough, Nugene spoke fluent English even though she'd never met anybody that spoke English. And she told me that she educated herself from watching TV because she couldn't get out of their fifth floor flat in Aleppo to go to school. And she literally taught herself fluent English from watching an American soap opera called Days of Our Lives. (laughs) She also, when I asked her what she thought of Europe, she said she was a bit disappointed, so surprised. I said, why are you disappointed? And she said, well... I used to watch MasterChef all the time, and I thought the food would look like that. <laughs> so the two sisters, Najin and Nazreen, had made a remarkable journey, and they'd crossed nine borders, traveling more than 2,500 miles. It's a hard enough journey to do as an able-bodied person, but as a disabled person, I thought it was astonishing, and she did it all with a smile on her face. 
um, finally they made it to Germany to be reunited with their brother and sister. And now she's living in Cologne and at school for the first time. And recently she was the first ever disabled person to testify to the um, UN Security Council in New York. Recently in London, actually, I went to hear the first Afghan women orchestra playing on a recent tour. And you can see again in their, this picture, they also had huge smiles on their faces. And like all Afghan women, they told me how worried that they are about the current talks going on between the Trump administration and the Taliban. Not that they don't want peace after all these years of war, but because they had at that time seen no women at all participating. Only in the most recent ninth round of talks did we see women allowed. And as you know, the Taliban banned music and did not let girls go to school or women to work. And Negin, who is the first female conductor in Afghanistan and part of this group, she told me, even if the Taliban come back and break our instruments, we will still have music in our hearts. So those are the kind of stories that I want to bring home in my suitcase, for they give me faith in humanity. Their resilience in the face of adversity shows to me that we're stronger than we think. Is it coincidence that they're all women? <laughs> Well, as a woman in the very male field of, of war correspondence, it always seems to me that men and women report in a very different way. My male colleagues focus on the bang-bang, and the fighters are usually male. On the rare occasion that they report about women in war, it's usually as passive victims, the weeping widow or the bereft mother. Whereas we female correspondents are more interested in what's going on behind the lines, how people keep life together and feed, educate and, and, um, educate and shelter their children as all hell is breaking loose. The mothers under siege in the old cities of Mosul or Aleppo, conjuring up sandwiches from fried flour and leaves and keeping warm by burning furniture or window frames. The people doing this are, of course, usually the women, and to me, they are the real heroes. Over and over, across the world, I have seen how women together can be a great force, and that we all want the same for our children wherever we are, and that one person or one small act can make a difference. Random Taliban. <laughs> I mentioned at the beginning my most recent trip to Congo and Jane at the City of Joy. And I think when you meet people like Jane, you realize that small things that often preoccupy us in everyday life, like a train running late or a person irritating you, don't really matter. In this time of fake news and alternative facts where different is too often seen as dangerous, these real people with real stories are what I believe we really need to hear to give us hope in the future. I'd like to leave you with some words from Jane. She said to me, bad things happen to me, but I want people to know and do something so these things don't happen to others, and I don't want to stay mired in darkness. Now I have a voice, I don't want to stay silent. Thank you. For those of you who have read the Old Testament and you know that God parted the Red Sea so that people would be liberated and be free. And even if you don't believe in what was revealed in the Old Testament, know that there is God's hand on Christina Lamb. And you must have a million angels around you. So while the questions are coming through, I have one question for you. Most, most women in the world are capable of achieving anything that a man can achieve and perhaps a million times more. Most people in the world are paralyzed by fear, insecurity, 
but mostly fear. Christina, this is a heartfelt question of mine because for all these hardworking volunteers here who go to the grassroots, who go to places that they've never been before to do projects and programs to uplift women and girls and rural communities, what is a lesson you can share from your life that has enabled you to overcome your deepest, deepest fears, transcend it, and bring the voices of the voiceless through your writings and through your stories? Thank you. Um, well, anybody that says they don't get scared, I don't believe for a moment. Um, I think that um, with what I do, obviously, I do go to dangerous places, but actually the moment that you get there and see what people are doing and living in those situations, you forget about it because you're seeing um, what people are doing. And as I just talked about, I think that the thing that gives me so much strength is seeing how people, you know, I meet mean, people are really living on the edge and go out in the morning not knowing if they'll come back again in the evening, day after day. Um, and yet they are so strong and it gives me a lot of faith that actually if you were in a really, I mean, God forbid, but if you were in a terrible situation like that, that you would be a lot stronger than you you think. So, And I think that one thing I've seen often, it's very easy to be overwhelmed by things and think oh, there's such an awful situation, I can't do anything. But actually one person can make a difference. Malala often says one girl, one teacher, one book, one pen can change the world. And I really believe that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's for all these thousand over ladies here because each and every one of them are making a great difference and will continue to make a difference. Yeah? And, and if you just follow some of the ways in which you, Christina, have been able to deal with. Yeah, and you're right. N none of us are fearless, but we, once you get into the moment, once you get into the, the experience. Now, do we have any questions that we can pose to Christina? Thank you. It's a lead up from the my question, I guess. How do you find the courage to do what you do? Well, like, like I said, um, I don't believe anyone who says they don't get scared in these situations. But it really, I think it's because what I'm doing is so, um, I'm so fascinated by the people I'm meeting and the places that I'm going to. And I'm very lucky to do a job where I've never been bored and I get to see People, um, you know, this sort of it sounds a bit cliched, but you know, the first page of history. Um, and uh, I think the hard, the really hard thing for me, and I referred to it a bit, is the fact that often it feels like you're not making a difference. So I think you have to have a lot of faith that you keep writing things and the situation doesn't change. I talked about Zimbabwe a couple of times in my talk. Um, and that's very frustrating. That's been going on for many years. And actually, as a journalist, it's difficult to cover because it's hard to keep editors interested in something if it's been going on for a long time. Same with the Chibok girls I mentioned in Nigeria. That happened more than five years ago. And yet, more than 100 of those girls are still in mm. captivity. But do you see any coverage of it now? You know, people have moved on. So I feel as a journalist a responsibility to try and keep some of these things in the news. But one of the ways that the job has changed a lot is um, partly in a good way is communication. So when I started out in the late 80s, um, do you remember telexes? Yeah. <laughs> um, and the height of technology was I had a Tandy word processor where you could just see three lines of green on green. Um, now with mobile phones and satellite phones, and I can send my story immediately from anywhere, the top of a mountain in the Hindu Kush or the middle of the desert. And that is great on one hand. Um, I do think it means that journalists are more vulnerable to 
propaganda and getting things wrong because you're not having so much knowledge when you file the stories. But the other way that things have changed that I, I find personally difficult is that everybody I meet now, I stay on WhatsApp with, which on one hand is great, but it means that you, all the time, people are sending you messages from these places asking, you know, what's going to happen and is your story going to make any difference? And I, I personally find that that is the hardest thing at my job, not the fear of being in these places, but answering people who have told me their stories and then I'm not able to say that things are going to change. Thank you. We have some great questions here. What is the one thing you think a small Soroptimist club in a peaceful country can do to make a change in justice for women? I think, you know, talking about it, making people aware. I think a lot of people don't realize the situation. You know, I, I started because I was so angry about the violence, sexual violence against women. Um, you know, it, rape costs nothing for the men, right? They, it's the cheapest weapon on earth. It's cheaper than yeah, a bullet. Yeah, and so I was so angry about what was happening and really started researching it a lot and talking to people. And I had no idea how difficult it is to get justice. Of course, it's difficult to get justice in rape anywhere, but rape in conflict is yeah, well. really difficult. And so, you know, making people aware of that, trying to put some pressure on politicians and trying to make people feel that there's something we should be doing because you can't it's no good just saying oh well it's always happened you know that actually we can do something but these people need help and the help starts with awareness yes that's true and on that note there's another question here and all the Soroptimists in the room will resonate with this. We as Soroptimists, we have been fighting for gender equalities, the Sustainable Development Goals. You know, we are in the forefront in all the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And still, it is very, very frustrating that women are not at the peacekeeping table. You know, um, we are not involved in decision making, designing the solutions. So... Perhaps you can share with us your, your wisdom of working with in, in the forefront. What can we do differently? How can we overcome these barriers and get to the decision-making tables? This is a, a very important question because yeah. study after study shows that where women are involved in mediating and peacekeeping, they are much more effective peace agreements. So, it, you know, it, it's ridiculous not having women involved in this. Um, and again, you know, I think it's a question of talking about it, making people aware. It's not acceptable. Yeah. And with Afghanistan, you know, lots of our politicians made a big thing about um, making women free again in Afghanistan. Lots of money, taxpayers' money was spent on projects for women. And so just to throw that all away at the end of the day would be awful. I mean, I have, I'm quoted Negin, the female conductor. I have hope because, you know, those women that, that fought so hard to have freedom are not about to just give it up. So they they are fighting back. And because of women like her, they now were included in the last round of talks. It took a long time, but, you know, so they started to be. And one woman even took her, her baby to the, the talks with the Taliban. Um, I was quite amused because the Taliban gave goodie bags at the, the talks, and the men got given a bag of perfume and dates. Um, the women got a headscarf and a prayer mat. Um, but the one thing that sort of gives me a bit of faith that things do change is, is you know, what's happening with the Me Too movement. I started off saying about... You know, I mean, for so many years I spoke on panels about things where I was the only woman. And, and now that's not acceptable. You know, women have to have at least an equal voice. And suddenly I find myself sitting on, on panels or events and it's all women panels. And, and that's brilliant. And that's something that's just happened really in a short time in, in the UK, just in the last six months or so. But it 
you know, and some of my women friends at the beginning were saying, oh, well, this is just tokenism and inviting women on a panel just because they feel they have to. But actually, it's already made a difference. Even if it was tokenism to start with, people are now used to the fact, no, actually, we have to hear women's voices. Yes, definitely. Talking from experience, you can just be one woman in a council with 24 men and you can still make, make your, get your point across and you can get, your, get the decisions, influence the decision making. Now on a lighter note, talking about the male dominated society and stereotyping, what was it like being this young, still young, I believe, still attractive Blonde journalists amidst a group of Taliban, Mujahideen men, who think that women should not be seen, should not be heard, and best wrapped up in black with just your two eyes peeping out. That's me adding to this question. So, over to you. Okay. Well, actually, I was always quite intrigued by this, because when I traveled with the Afghan Mujahideen, so this was before the Taliban, but was all male fighters. And they seemed to regard female foreign journalists almost as if we were a kind of third sex, you know, that we were something um, alien. And, uh, and so it was fine, actually, traveling with them. There was one group I went with that um, were the, the Kabul commander, Abdul Haq, who I got to know quite well. And he used to say to me, um, girls don't go to war. And so he, he didn't want to take me with his men, even though I'd got to know him well. So he actually um, made me go to one of his training camps. And um, it's funny, because I used to go to fun fairs a lot when I was a kid growing up. And I was used to have goes on those stores where you shoot things. So I was actually quite good at shooting. Um, so I turned out to be better than most of his fighters. Um, not that I got involved, nor do I ever think journalists should have weapons, but I mean to prove myself. To them. Um, but then later, and I travelled to Kandahar with Hamid Karzai and a group called the Mullahs Front, who were the very uh, were the people who became the Taliban. And um, I traveled around on the backs of their motorbikes and I w had to dress as a young Kandahari man. And that turns out to have risks of its own because in Kandahar, men quite like other young men. So oh. <laughs> actually some of them were quite disappointed when they realized I was a woman. <laughs> Madam moderator, Anusha, we will need to wrap up. All right. So... Um since then, no other questions being allowed up here on stage, and that's the privilege of your facilitator. I have one final question. I've recently become a grandma. I have one and only little granddaughter who is 20 months old. And if when you look into the eyes of the little ones in all the countries that you've been to, right? When you look in the eyes of a little girl, and knowing all that we all know happens to little girls these days, Right? The atrocities that can happen to a little girl and the deprivation and the discrimination from female genital mutilation to rape and uh, child brides and all the traumas that are still inflicted on little girls and even little boys around the world. Christina, when you've gone to all these horrific places, when you look into the eyes of the little ones, what do you tell them? How do you give them hope so that they will all be like Malala or rather never have to endure what Malala had to go through? Honestly, the number one thing if I could do everywhere is education. Nothing makes more difference than that. If people are aware of their rights and know um, and can fulfill their potential, that just makes all the difference in the world so um and i, I actually i'm hopeful about the young generation because we're seeing things like the extinction rebellion the young people coming out and saying you know we can't just keep talking about climate change as something we put off it, it's happening now it's going to affect us and 
you know, it's a crisis that we need to act on. So seeing young people coming and talking about things like that I, I gives me a lot of um, faith, actually, and optimism in, in the future. So I... I just tell you one thing about Malala to end on because when one of the great things about working with her was getting to know her and her family and knowing her as a young girl, not just as the Malala you see in public. And she's very funny. Um, and she has a brother two years younger than her, Kushal, and they fight the whole time. So when she was um, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, my son, who's the same age as her brother and had got to know them, said to me, Mom, how can Malala get the Nobel Peace Prize? She's always fighting with her brother. <laughs> Thank you. May I now invite SI President Murray to hand over our gifts of appreciation to President Anusha and Christina. Let's join them in a big round of applause. is the big moment to get Christina Lamb over here. It is not easy. It's miraculous. So let's give her a stand up women. Thank you. Stand up for women. Stand up for justice. Stand up for equality. Stand up for peace. Stand up for prosperity. Stand up for gender equality. Stand up for Christina Lamb and for all that she has done on planet Earth. May you always be a messenger of peace, of hope, and of love. <laughs>